Hey, well, welcome back to week three of our series, Soul Detox. Before I jump into that, let me just also encourage all of you, if you've recently made a decision uh, to follow Christ, if you've become a follower of Jesus, the Bible says the very next step you should take is to be baptized into Jesus. And if you've never been baptized as an adult, uh, I would encourage you, I can't think of a better way actually to wrap up this series that we're in, Soul Detox, uh, than with a baptism celebration Sunday. So on February 4th, Super Bowl Sunday, we're throwing a huge tailgate party. You know our church, man. We know how to throw parties, amen, and invite our friends. So invite your friends. And I can't think of a better way to wrap up this series. You know, we're, we're talking about how God can cleanse the toxins, not only out of our physical bodies, but out of our souls. And baptism, man, it's kind of like a cleansing, man. Uh, you know, the Bible says if we identify with Christ in his death and burial, we will also identify with him in his resurrection. And that's the picture of baptism, man. Uh, so we, we have this huge, like, Jesus jacuzzi. It's warm. It's clean. And um, it's not heart-shaped tub like Paradise Stream, but, you know, it's close. And so you go into the water, and it's like you're dying to your old life, and you're coming up as a brand-new person cleansed in Christ. So if you've never made a decision to follow Christ, or if you have in the past, but you've just never followed through with a, a, a statement. And here's the statement of baptism. It's, a, it's an outward um, expression of an inward commitment. That, that you, it doesn't save you. The only thing that saves you is what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago when he laid down his life. Can we make some noise for Jesus, for what he's done for us? And if you choose to become a follower of Jesus, you're identifying with him. Just as he was laid into a grave, you go into a watery grave. And as he was ris- rose from the grave, you also come up out of the water, a new person, cleansed, come on free, and um, ready to do life in the power of Jesus. So... Come on, be baptized. It'd be our honor to celebrate you and your faith. Well, we are in uh, this series called Soul Detox. This is part three. And uh, the the main uh, thought for this series uh, is this, that we're not a body with a soul, but we are a soul with a body. Right? Uh, We're not a, a body that happens to have a soul. We're actually a soul that happens to have a body. And this time of year, especially, a lot of people are doing a lot of thinking and working on their on their physical body, right? Uh, Becca told you last week that that we recently uh, joined the gym. It's been four years uh, since I've been in the gym, and I suffered a you know a, a herniated disc uh, four years ago, and and so I've just been out of shape, and and we've been back in the in the gym, and I don't know, man. Um, the gym looks a lot like church on Easter this time of year. <laughs> it's just like it's packed. There's like people everywhere, right? And people like me that haven't been in the gym in a while, we kind of like coming to church. If you haven't been in church in a while, you're kind of like sheepishly kind of walking in. Like I'll be over here in the corner, you know, on the treadmill. Don't look at me, right? And, um, but we've been having a lot of fun. And, and if you know me, you know I'm like, I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of guy. You know, if I'm in, I am all the How many guys are like that? You're like all or nothing. You go in, it's all the way in. You get pushed the chips, man. You're doubling down, right? And so on top of this uh, 21-day Daniel fast that we're in right now, um, and, you know, and, and this is a really uh, good uh, time of year to do that. Um, and I know many hundreds of you are fasting and you're praying right now. I just want you to know I am so incredibly uh, proud of you and for seeking God at the beginning of the year for all that he wants to do in through your life in 2018. I'm believing this is going to be your best year, my best year. Come on, this is going to be our best year ever. We're going to say that in faith today. And so uh, we've been fasting and, you know, you know, taking care of our physical body, and that's good. And, you know, when you stop, you know, eating all the stuff um, that tastes good, um, because pretty much anything that's good for you uh, tastes good. Uh, I'm sorry, anything that's, that tastes good is not good for you, right? Have you noticed that? And so when we're fasting, we're not eating any of that, and your body's like, dude, what happened? Like, Where's all the gravy? You know, where's all the sugar, right? Where's all this? You know, and, and what happens when you do that? You take all that away and you fast. Um, it's like a natural cleanse for your body, and it gets rid of all these chemicals that are just kind of hanging around, right? And so, you know, I'm all the way in. And so on top of this 21-day uh, fast, which is also like a natural cleanse, Beck and I have been doing uh, once a week a two-day, like, um, cleanse fast on top of it where you just drink this drink and um, it just kind of starts working in your body. And if you ever choose to do that, let me just give you a little uh, word of wisdom. Some of you are way ahead of me. 
Some of you on this 21-day Daniel fast already know what I'm talking about. Um, when you plan your day, you just got to really plan your day so that you're not like any more than, I'm just going to say, 25 feet from a restroom. That's just all I'm saying because it's just a cleanse. And you think, that's nothing more. It, oh, yet yeah, apparently there is. And um, so, but it's good to take care of your body. It's healthy, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but after four, this is day 14 of the fast. I mean, I just feel sharper. I feel, does anybody else know what I'm talking about? A, a sensitivity to the things of God, a heightened sensitivity to people who are around me, um, to reach out, you know, uh, with kindness and compassion to people, to talk to people, to slow down and make time for people, uh, a hunger for his word. You know, you start starving your stomach and you st- starve your flesh and you start to feed your spirit. I'm telling you, man, God starts to move in your heart, heart in just a, in a special way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Say amen, amen. Listen whatever, listen, whatever you feed grows and whatever you starve dies. So when you start starving things that aren't good for you in your physical body, here's what you, you, just, you know what starts to grow is you're, you, you start getting thirsty. Like, man, you wake up like, I need some water, right? Because that's what you're feeding your body. We're not drinking any of those, you know, all that sugary soda and that, um, the stuff in the p- pink packets. I love the pink. I used to have like three or four. I know it causes you know, cancer and lab rats, and I'm just saying, they got really out of shape lab rats, that's my theory, but I haven't had any of the pink stuff in like 14 days, I just feel better, right, and and whatever you feed grows, and whatever you starve, it dies, and when you start feeding to your spirit, and this, and, and, and 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 faith, your faith begins really to grow, and and I think it's so important for us to take care of our bodies, amen, the Bible says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Some of us have been treating it like a bar, but listen, it's a temple. Come on, somebody. It, it's a temple. It's not a tavern, right? And so we should take care of our body. And that's what this really uh, fast is all about. That's what this series is all about, this soul detox, because while it's good to take care of your physical body, even Paul says this in the New Testament, it's even more important to take care of your spiritual, your soul. I mean, there is physical benefits of taking care of your body, but there's the spiritual benefits of taking care of your soul far outweigh, the Bible says, the benefits of taking care of your your physical body. And so that's the whole point behind this series, Soul Detox, that, hey, we're not just a, a, a body with a soul. We are really a soul that just happens to have a body, and that our soul, listen, when God made you, he put inside of you a never dying soul. Listen to me, friend. Everybody lives forever. And the choices that you make on this side of, the, uh, of eternity will determine where your soul will live forever. And my encouragement, my hope is today is that if you've not chosen to put your faith in God, that today you'll do that. That you'll choose this day whom you will serve, the Bible says. That you'll put your faith in God, that you'll live in eternity in the presence of Almighty God. Wouldn't that be great? Come on, if somebody made that decision, come on, today. So um, so we're taking care of our, our, of our soul, and we're start, I can't think of a better way to start 2018 uh, other than just trying to get rid of some of the toxins. You know, these things that weigh us down, these negative chemicals, toxins, maybe in our brain that cause us to think, you know, negative, self-defeating thoughts and these other habits or attitudes that we might have or behavior. So we're getting rid of some of the toxins spiritually, the things that will trip us up, the things that chip away from our peace and our, and our happiness and our health and our, and our rest uh, in our soul so that we can focus on it. So week one, we talked about um, a, a hurried soul, a hurry-sick soul. We, t- we talked about finding a new flow for our lives in 2018, to find a new rhythm so that we can run at a pace that's sustainable, so that we can be healthy, so we don't have to self-medicate just to get through the day. And then last week, we talked about a heavy soul. And I just want to say, didn't my wife Becca, who preached last week, preach the best message you have ever heard? That? I'm just saying, the girl can preach. I'm just, if you missed last week, you need to go online right now. It's better than what I'm going to share with you right now. And you just put your headphones on. You just, when you amen, I'll, you just be amen in her, okay? But go online, mycommunity.church, and you can watch past messages, archive messages. It was a powerful message. So proud of her. And she talked about how Jesus can heal your heavy soul. Amen? That when we are, are still before God, 
to put our hope and trust in him. Powerful, powerful message. Today, uh, I want to talk to you about a tortured soul. A tortured soul. I see so many people, and I bump into so many people. I talk, have so many conversations with people that just have a tortured soul. And for not all, but for so many people that I talk to, um, I think the source behind their struggle, the thing that tortures them, uh, ultimately comes down to fear. I just, I just bump into so many people and I hear so many stories as a, as a pastor and, and, and typically, eventually, when you, when you listen long enough, it, it, you can pinpoint it comes down to some kind of fear. That, and that's just not like I'm afraid of the boogeyman kind of childish fear. I'm talking about a debilitating fear that tortures people's a crippling fear. A fear that makes you want to crawl back into bed instead of getting out of bed in the morning to face your day. A fear that would manipulate your mind to maintain just mediocrity in your life, a fear that would hold you back from walking into your God-given destiny and to, and to walk, as the Bible says, you're more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ, that we are called to live an abundant life, a life that, that is above and beyond average, a life where we're just not surviving, but we're truly thriving if we know Jesus. But there's this fear that can often overwhelm and, 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 and overtake our soul and torture us and hold us back from all that God has from all the dreams, I believe God puts a dream in the heart of every man, woman, and child. That he has a purpose and he's got a plan for your life. And oftentimes this thing called fear, I call them giants. These, these giants of fear uh, in, in life and also in work can, can stand in our way and prevent us from experiencing all that God has for us in this world. I don't know what you might be afraid of right now. I don't know what fear you are facing in this moment. I, I, I've talked to a lot of people over the last couple of weeks, and here's one of the fears that I've heard people say, I, I, I'm just afraid, Pastor, what's going to happen when this fast is over? I was like, that never even occurred to me. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, listen, you know, Pastor, listen, here's, here's the deal. I fasted. Um, I've been a lifelong alcoholic, and I've been fasting alcohol, and God has, like, removed it from me. I haven't had a drink in two weeks. I, I'm waking up in the morning. Uh, the morning for me now, Pastor, it's like my reward. I wake up with a clear head. I'm not cloudy and foggy. I'm not exhausted all the time. I, I, I feel like, um, like a new person. And I'm afraid now that I haven't even been, like God has, she said to me, God has taken it from me. This desire, like I used to say, oh, I just need a drink to relax at night. Then I realized I couldn't even get through the night without, without not just one drink, but a few drinks. That I couldn't even sleep with it. Now I'm afraid that, that God has taken this from me during this season of, of prayer and fasting. I'm afraid what's going to happen on day 22. All the urges going to come back. Am I going to fall back? And I had another woman say to me, during this fast, she has made a decision to leave a, a, a lifelong abusive relationship. She's finally got the power and the courage and the strength from God to get up and walk out on this abusive relationship. And now she's afraid what's going to happen after day 21. Will she go back? I've had guys come up to me and tell me they've walked away from alcohol, from drugs. I mean, I'm not talking about a, a using, you know, recreationally or just one. I'm talking about this is, ev this is a lifestyle. Every day. They've walked. God has, like, removed it from them. Drugs. Alcohol, um, marijuana, um, um, meth, crack. I, and these guys, they, they're walking in this newfound freedom right now, and they're, they're afraid what's going to happen. Here's what they're, they're afraid about the future. What's going to happen? What's going to happen on day 22? Is the enemy going to come back and, and try to rob me of this newfound peace and freedom that I have in Christ? I don't know what you might be afraid of today. I don't know, you, you, it might be some kind of financial fear, some financial giant that's in your way. How, you, how, you, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to make the mortgage? How are you going to grow the business? How, maybe there's issues of cash flow in the business, and, and you're, you're just like, it's, it's difficult. And now, uh, maybe for you, seasonally, you come into some, some dry seasons in the winter months. I don't know what it might be for you, and you're wondering, how am I going to make this happen? How am I going to grow this business? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to put gas in the car? How am I going to put food on the table? Maybe there's a financial giant. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's something going on in your marriage. And, you, you know, you're just, your marriage is hanging by a thin thread. 
There's something relationally happening. Maybe it's something with your kids. They're, they're fighting some kind of battle, and you feel completely helpless as a parent to step in. Maybe it's some other, maybe for you it's a health issue, and it's a, a giant of cancer or a giant of diabetes, some other uh, g- uh, f- uh, health giant that you're facing. I don't know what your giant might be today, but I am glad to be able to stand before you and say, you know, there's a wonderful story in Scripture that teaches us how to deal with giants. It's a story that's told in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's a story maybe you've heard before. It's, it's known as David versus Goliath. How many have ever heard the story of David, right? I mean, it's so popular, it's almost become culturally just known uh, of the story of David versus uh, Goliath, the giant. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me in 1 Samuel 17. Let me just give you a little background. If Maybe if you're not like a Bible guy, that's cool. Uh, that's okay. Maybe you don't have a Bible with you. you can, if, if not, I'll, I'll put all the, the scripture up here on the, on the teaching TV, and we can all be on the same page together. But if you've got a Bible or iPad or iPhone, you can just uh, open up your, your Bible app to 1 Samuel 17. And I want to talk to you today how you can face the giants that are in your life. Some of you have some giants. How many would say, you know what, you got, I got some giants, I got some giants, Pastor. How many got some giants in your life? Right, health, financial, right, relationship, yeah, addiction. Maybe there's some things going on. Well, let me give you some practical advice. Before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of a, a background uh, biblically to this story that happens. You know, 3,000 years ago, halfway around the world in Israel, um, you, you, it helps to know a little bit of the geography and the topography of Israel. Israel is about the size of New Jersey. How many are familiar with Jersey? All right. How many of you from Jersey? Come on, where are you at, Jersey? All right, yes, they're always the loudest people in the room. Like, <laughs> only thing louder than that is a Puerto Rican from New Jersey. All right. <laughs> there, there it is. There it is. I knew it. All right. All right. So, um, so I've been to Israel. It's about the size of New Jersey, almost the same. And just like New Jersey, one of its entire borders, it borders water. Uh, for Jersey, it's the Atlantic Ocean. For Israel, it's the Mediterranean Sea, and it's flipped. On the western side of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea, and it's the flat coastal plains. On the eastern side of Israel, there's a mountain ridge uh, that runs north and south all the way down um, uh, the eastern border of of, of, of Israel, I keep wanting to say New Jersey, of, of Israel, and so you've got mountains to the east, and you've got these flat coastal plains uh, to the west, and you've got the Mediterranean Sea, and 3,000 years ago, there were people who came from Crete, they were known as the Philistines, they were a seafaring people, and they sailed down uh, to uh, modern day Israel, where like Tel Aviv would be, and they were, they were people of the coastal plains, and um, they were the arch nemesis uh, the rivals of the kingdom of Israel. They're always fighting against each other. Well, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a, a, a geograph, uh, a, a, mount, a set of mountain ridges and valleys that connected the um, coastal plains in the west with a mountain range in the east. It was a series of, 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 um, of mountains and valleys that would go from east to west and connect these two land um, parts of, uh, of Israel. And it was a very strategic uh, place. It was called the Shephala. And because if you wanted to advance into the high ground, where you always had the military advantage, that's why in Israel today, uh, all of the, uh, many of the great historical cities of the, of, of the Israelites are in the mountains. Jerusalem is in the mountains. Hebron is in the mountains. Bethlehem is in the mountains. And, and, and so on. Because if you can control the high ground, you can control the whole area militarily. And so... Uh, the Shephelah that connected the coastal plains with the mountains was very strategic because it was the means by which you could advance into the mountains to take control of the entire region. And so uh, 3,000 years ago, these, um, these Philistines decided to go to war against the kingdom of Israel. And they had climbed up one of these, uh, they began to climb up one of these valleys um, uh, to go to war, one of these ridges to go to war uh, in the mountains with, um, uh, with the Israelites. And um, what happened was uh, the Israelites uh, had scouts and they had seen the movement of the enemy troops. And so they went down uh, to meet them in one of these valleys uh, where they began to advance. Uh, That valley was called the Valley of Elah. Uh, This is the Valley of Elah. I was I was there. Uh, It's a great picture of the Valley of Elah, and you can see here these mountain ridges that are running east to west, and when this 
battle takes place between David and Goliath. Here you see to the, um, uh, to, to the north, uh, the Philistines had taken um, uh, their enemy camp here, and the Israelites had made camp here. And there was like this, there was like this standoff between uh, these two mountain ridges with the Valley of Elah uh, in, in between them. Um, th- this Shephelah is full of valleys like this. And uh, they're, they're beautiful, these valleys. They're filled with like, here's a wheat field. Uh, they were also filled with just uh, groves of mighty oaks, dense oak groves, uh, uh, vineyards. Uh, so it's a beautiful place and b- very strategic militarily because you have the high ground. Well, what happened when they came in the 3,000 years ago against, to come to war against each other with the Philistines on one side, the Israelites over here, they were kind of at a standoff because neither side could attack because to attack the opposing army, you'd have to walk off this ridge down into the valley, therefore exposing yourself to the enemy with no protection. It would be like committing suicide. Are you with me? You with me? Okay. So you have this standoff, these two political powers, and they're just staring at each other. There's this standoff between two political powers. Does this sound, does anybody watch the news? (laughs) Nothing's happening. Two opposing political, right? It's a standoff. Not for a couple weeks. For like six weeks, you've got this enemy over here, you've got the Philistines over here, and nothing is happening. Well, eventually, uh, the Philistines, have en- they had enough. So they decide to send their biggest and their baddest warrior down onto the valley floor. He was, he was a giant. His name was Goliath. And, and he walks down to the valley floor, and he starts to um, hurl insults towards the Israelites. And he starts to um, um, say awful things, disrespectful things about not just the Israelites, but also about their God. And he says, won't anybody come down here and fight me like a man? Let's do this. He says, come on, let's go face-to-face, mano a mano, man-to-man combat. And, and this, this was a, a military practice that was a, a, a tradition in, the, in, those, in those days where instead of two armies slaughtering each other, um, they would, they would uh, practice this uh, tradition known as single combat. One side would send their biggest warrior to fight. The other side uh, of the other army would send one of their warriors, and they would do battle, and each side would respect the outcome. So depending on who won, winner takes all. So he, he, Goliath walks down to the field. He hurls these insults. He says, come on, somebody, fight me. And um, that's where we pick up the story. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. A champion named Goliath was from Gath. He came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Uh, what that means to us today he was big, all right? He was, like, in the Hebrew, that's what that means. The dude was big. Actually, he was 9 feet 9 inches tall, 10 inches tall. He's almost uh, the size of a basketball hoop. Literally, he was twice the size of every other man. Twice the size. Average man at that time, a little over 5 feet tall. So this was a giant, uh, almost 10 feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale of armor, bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. It was heavy. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and bronze javelin was slung on his back. A spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. And his shield bearer went ahead of him. So here's this giant, and he walks down uh, to the field, and he hurls all these insults, and he's standing on the valley floor, and he says, come on out here. Send me your biggest and your baddest guy. Let's do this. Who's going to take me on? And you read the story, and it says that there was a a great fear that was struck in the heart of all the Israelite soldiers. They ran and they hid. They were scared. This guy was ferocious. He was a massive warrior. He's Not only is he twice everybody else's size, he's covered in full body armor, head to toe. This guy, he was ferocious. He was a terrifying warrior, and no one from the Israelite army would go out and face him, oh, except one. He was a kid. He wasn't even a soldier. He was a shepherd. His name was David. He said, I'll fight him. He goes to the king, and he tells the king, you know, I'll, I'll go fight him. Nobody else is going to fight him. I'll fight him. And the king is like, what are you, stupid? 
Is this like, you know, suicide mission? Like, you want to die? Like, what, what are you talking? And, and the king relents, but then he has no other option because no other man will stand up to fight this guy. So he decides to allow David to go and fight Goliath. But before he sends him out, he, he, he puts all of his, the king's armor, he puts it on, he puts it on David. And David, he tries it on. He's like, man, this isn't going to work. It's not going to fit. So he takes it off. And instead, he just bends down to the earth, and he picks up five smooth stones. He puts it in a little leather pouch attached to his belt next to a slingshot. And he marches down off of that ridge with nothing more than a slingshot and a shepherd's staff in his hand. Before he leaves, I love what the king of Israel, Saul, said to David. He said this. He said, um, go and the Lord be with you. In other words, hey, good luck, kid, praying for you. <laughs> hey, let me know how it works out, man. Shoot me like a text or something. I'll be up, like, on the ridge, like, with my phone, like, filming it all. I'm going to post it later. I'll be praying for you. Uh, we're going to get a lot of likes on this. Going to go Facebook Live. It's going to be huge, right? And, um, and so David walks down, and he meets the giant on the valley floor. I love what King David who would be eventually king, he's just now a kid, says to the giant. He says this, come here. He said, oh, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the the, the giant saying first to David, because when he got, when when David gets down to the, to the, to the, to the, um, to the plains to meet him, as soon as the giant lays eyes on him, he's insulted. He's like, like, seriously? This is, He's insulted. And so he's like, this is the guy. Okay, man, this is what you want to do. Here's what I'm going to do to you. Come on over here, boy. And I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. In other words, I am going to eat you up. I'm going to spit you out. And I'm going to let the birds and the animals come and mop up what's left of you. And then I love what David says in response. David said to him, the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He says, I come against you in that day. He said, I will, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down. I'll cut off your head. This very day, I'll give your carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. In other words, here's what... Here's what this kid says. You want to do this? Come on. Let's dance. Like, come on, Cletus. Come on. That's an Eddie Murphy reference. Some of you might want to know. All right. Like, come on. Like, let's do it. And he's like, come on. You want to dance? Let's let's make this happen right here, right now. You think you're going to take me out? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to feed your body to the birds and to the beasts because I come to you in a greater power. The power of the Lord God Almighty. And with that, he reaches into his little pouch. He takes out one of those stones and he puts it into his sling. And he begins to whirl it around like this. And it gets fast. (laughs) Gets really fast. And he lets this thing go. And it hits the giant right between the eyes where there was no body armor. Before he knew it, he had hit the deck. And David ran over and grabbed his sword and separated his head from his body. The Israelites win. The Philistines tuck tail. And they run all the way home to the coastal plains by the Mediterranean. See, I know for some of you today, um, this is the story of David versus Goliath. But for some of you today, you're facing some giants of your own. Hey, you might never have to face a 10-foot man that wants to kill you. But you have to face some giants nonetheless in life. They might be giants of addiction. They might be some kind of uh, giants of an eating disorder, giants of financial pressure. They could be giants of depression or fear. I don't know what kind of fear that you may be facing. I don't know what your giant looks like, but I can, based on this story, share with you just a, a couple quick thoughts that will help you face the giants and overcome. That remembering that you do not stand there alone, you stand there along with the Lord God Almighty. And I want you to know God is bigger than any giant you will ever face in your life. So here, if you want to take some notes, write this down. 
You're facing some giants today, something that seems like an insurmountable obstacle in your path from experiencing the God uh, dream that he has for your life. Number one, start working with what you've got and don't worry about what you're not. Start working with what you've got and don't worry about what you're not. I see so many people facing giants and they just want to sit around and wait for something that they don't have. And they'll sit and while they're waiting, just like those military armies, they're waiting for something. They're sitting six weeks. You're facing some giants and you're just waiting for something that you don't have instead of working with what you've already got. Listen, don't sit around and wait. Somebody should be like, well, I don't have enough. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough opportunities. I don't have enough connections. I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. Listen, when you're facing giants, don't sit around and just wait for something to happen. Don't sit around and wait for your ship to come in. You better dive in the water and swim out to it. Listen, if you're facing some giants, you've got to take some action full of God and the Holy Spirit that will prompt you to move in the direction of the very thing that you fear. Listen, when you're facing giants, don't just, just start working with what you've got. Don't worry about what you're not. Some of you today, you, you, you're, you're facing these giants, these things that are in front of you. So, well, I only have a high school education. Okay, well, use that. I got a good friend right here in this community. I've been getting to know him better over the last few months, and he's kind of told me a story, and he's built a phenomenal business. He's even here today. All of you would know it if I would share it. I just haven't asked him for permission, so I'm not going to share it. But um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal story, nonetheless, that he grew up in New Jersey on the streets. Really tough neighborhood. Got involved in the underworld and was involved in all kinds of things. He didn't know the Lord. Wasn't really living for the Lord. Got involved in all kinds of stuff and didn't have much more than a high school education, even if he had that. But he had an entrepreneurial spirit, and he had a good work ethic, and he started working and building businesses and, and started in nightclub industries and, and built some of those businesses right here in the Poconos. And then God began to get a hold of his heart and began to, began to make some changes in his life and began to build a wonderful business, now multiple businesses, and he employs a lot of people, and he does a lot of good for a lot of people right here. And he started with a high school education, and he'll tell you that face-to-face. -face. Sit around and wait for what you don't have. Start with what you've got. Start with what you've got. Don't worry about what you're not. So you try to sell yourself short. Well, I can't do this. I don't come from the right side of the tracks, and I didn't have the opportunity that they had, and I didn't have the opportunity she had, and I was discriminated against this and that. And I'm sorry that you've experienced all that, but listen, complaining about that's not going to change your future and your destiny. You need to step out in faith knowing that God is with you and work with what you've got. Don't worry about what you're not. Then we see uh, Saul, you know, as I said earlier, tries to uh, protect uh, David from getting killed instantly by putting his armor uh, on him. And here's the scripture. It says uh, uh, Saul just, uh, dressed David in his own tunic, put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet in his head. And David fastened on a sword over the tunic and he tried walking around because he was not used to them. So have you ever as a dad, like, you know, you come home, you take your shoes off and you got a little kid. And then your little kid, he sticks his feet, his little, little bitty feet into your big dad's shoes, right? And he starts clomping around. Dad, look at me. I'm like, dad, right? And, he, and, and the shoe is like as big as his leg, right? And he's clomping around the house, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? How many dads? know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, you get little, this is what David looked like, you know, clonking around in, in, in Saul's armor. And it didn't fit. It wasn't tailored. It wasn't made for him. It was made for Saul. Saul was a grown man. This is a kid. He hadn't even filled out yet. He's not a grown man yet. He hadn't even lost any hair yet. He didn't even have a bad back waking up in the morning. Like, he don't even know that. He's a kid. This didn't fit him. He clung. He's like, man, this doesn't feel good. It's painful. It's like chafing. You know, you get that chafing. You know, guys, first time you go to the shore jersey, it's like, oh, this is not good, right? It's like walking around. You ever watch a guy walk around the mall like this, kind of just going, yeah, that's chafing. That's, that, that hurts, man. That's painful, right? And this is, I'm sorry, was that too much information? I'm sorry. <laughs> and so he's like, man, this isn't going to work for me. And, and, and so you know what he does? He takes all that stuff off. He says, man, oh, well, now I can move. This is who I am. Oh, man, see, here's the problem I see so many people when you're facing giants. You fall prey to what I call the Saul's armor syndrome. You're trying to fit yourself into something that was never made for you. 
You're trying to be somebody that God never intended for you to be. I mean, I see this everywhere. Not only in every junior high school and high school across America, when every kid sees, well, they look like that and they talk like that. They carry themselves like, now I got to dress like him or her and I got to be like that and do my hair and do my makeup or try to be like this and put on the face and, and all the Instagram and all. I got be, to be successful. No, no, no. I see in business too. I just pick on teenagers. I see some guys in business trying to grow their business. They see another guy, how he grew his business. So I got to make my business just like his business. So I'm going to copy his pattern. I'm going to copy his model. I'm going to copy his plan. I just want you to know there's, there's more than one way to do something. There's more than one way to, to grow a business. There's more than one way uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, as we used to say, skin a cat. No offense to all you cat lovers out there. But there's more than one. Listen. By the way, some of you just helped me preach this today. Some of you parents, you're trying to make your kid fit into something that God never intended them to be. Listen to me. Let me preach it. Some of you wives, you're trying to make your man, your husband, into some man that God never intended him to be. Hey, I saw I would get some more amens from the men out there. A little <laughs> oof, something, like a hoo like a something. Listen, listen. Don't fall into Saul's armor syndrome. How about this? When God made you, he just wants you to be you. You're unique. There's no one else like you. You are a masterpiece. He has called you, equipped you. He has designed you. And he has anointed you. He has gifted you. So why not just you be you? Don't try to be somebody else in a copycat. You're bound to fail. When you fall prey to Saul's armor syndrome, just be yourself. God didn't create a clone when he made you. He made you unique. You just be you. So David, he picks up his staff and he picks up his sling and his bag of rocks. And I know it didn't look much. It didn't look like much to the untrained eye. But that little sling he had and those five smooth stones, they really packed a punch. In fact, um, you, you know, uh, this wasn't, you know, David's first rodeo. Some people think when you read this story, was this dude nuts? Like, has he completely lost his mind? He's going to walk down there and try to, he's going to try to go to battle with a guy that's twice his size. He's a ferocious, you know, well-known warrior. He, his name is renowned of the men that he's killed. He's twice, he's covered full body armor. He doesn't stay, is he nuts? And I would say this, no, he's not nuts. David was a kid, but he was a shepherd. And he was a man of faith, and he knew God was with him, but he also knew that he had been training his whole life for this. He had to defend his flock and himself when he would spend weeks at a time out in the fields, protecting his sheep that are helpless from the predators. Uh, bear. He, the Bible even says in his past he had killed a bear with his own hands. This wasn't the first giant that David ever faced and he knew if God was with him in the past come on somebody God is going to be with you in the future because God is faithful he changes not he's the same yesterday come on today and forever so David he walks down there to the untrained eye that slingshot didn't look like very much you know it's interesting to know though if you'd like to like me the, the study the history of warfare at this time in history there was three main uh three main um kinds of warriors. There were the cavalry that rode in chariots on the, and horseback. There were the heavy infantry that would march in full body armor and carry heavy swords and shields and fight hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then there were the slingers that they were the trained um, um, artillery. And when most of us think of a slingshot, we think of one of those little, little plinkers, ding, you know, little plinkers, ding. I've, we've had a lot of those in my house and we've broken more than one window. Don't you hit my flat screen TV, bro, with that. Uh, you, we'll have a funeral over at the church, son, if you, you hit my, with your, anyway. Um, but this isn't, this isn't the kind of slingshot we're talking about. This is what David's slingshot looked like. This is a medieval uh, slingshot 3,000 years ago. It was a piece of leather uh, tied with two um, leather straps, these long cords. And they would take a stone and they would put it in the middle and they would hold it like this. And they'd begin to whirl it around like this in the air, and then they would let go of one of the strings, and they would aim it with pinpoint precision at the target. And they were trained, and they were experts. Um, there are some people who studied uh, slings, 
and uh, throughout history and by people. I think the technical term for them uh, are nerds. Um, there's these nerds, these, <laughs> these sling nerds that still live in their mother's basement and play video games, but um, I'm not married. But um, they studied sl slingshots. They did their PhD in them. And, um, and um, they've discovered, they've run some nerdy calculations, and, and they've discovered that an expert slinger, when they would whirl it around in preparation, they could get the rotation up to six or seven times per second. That's a lot of RPMs right there. Matter of fact, uh, when you would let it go, um, the, if you do the ballistics on it, it would be traveling the velocity of 35 meters per second. That means if David was standing there in front of Goliath, he was 100 feet away, and he just stood there like, like looking like an idiot with a slingshot, you know, a slinger against a heavy infantry, 100 feet away, looked like an idiot. Oh, yeah, you're going to beat me? Okay, we'll be you. We'll see you. I'm going to burge in the beast and blah, 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 cut your head off. That's what he looked like. At 35 meters per second, once he let that go, that would have hit Goliath right between the eyes in less than a second. Before he knew what was happening, David runs up and cuts his head off with his own sword while his heart is still beating. Here's what I'm just trying to say. What you have is more then it appears when God is with you. What you have to the untrained eye, it might not look like much to somebody else, but little becomes much when you put it into the hands of God. He said, I don't stand here on my own behalf. I stand here on behalf of the Lord God Almighty. Here's what that means. So you got a two-year associate's degree? Well, you use that. You got an entry-level position? You show up tomorrow for work, not on time but early, with a smile on your face and a spring in your step, a song in your heart, and a positive word in your mouth. And you work, and you use what you've got, and you give it your best. Don't worry about what you're not. Don't worry about what you don't have. Use what you have. What God has already put into your hands, it might not look like much, but when you entrust it to the Lord God Almighty, little can become much when you put it into his hands. I don't care. You might only have two weeks or three weeks of sobriety, but little can become much when you put it into the hands of God. So you get up tomorrow morning and you make a daily decision that you're not going to drink and that you're not going to use or whatever it is that the demons that you're facing and you take your life and it might not feel like much. I don't care how big the enemy might be. I don't care how small you might feel. I don't care how strong they might look like. I don't care how weak you might feel because the Bible says God uses the weak things of the world to take down the strong. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You be you. Don't worry about what you don't got. Just work with what you have. Put it into the hands of God and you trust him with it. You know, these other sling nerds, um, they also discovered something else. That these rocks from the Valley of Elah, and I've been there and I've held them um, they're, they're, they're made of, of, a, um, of a substance called um, barium sulfate. It's a very heavy and dense, and it's a, they're, they're like thick rocks, not like porous, like limestone. And when a slinger would get that going, 7 RPMs per second, 35 meters per second, it would have the same ballistic power of a bullet coming out of a 45 caliber handgun. I just want you to know, gang, listen, don't sell yourself short. You're stronger, and you're more powerful, and you can do more in this life if you take it and you surrender it into the hands of an almighty God and a loving heavenly father. Come on, his name is Jesus, and he wants to, he wants to use you and empower you today. Here's what I learned a long time ago. Jesus plus me equals a majority. 
Listen, hey, if God be for me, then who can be against me? Come on. God is going to fight this battle for you. Whatever you're facing, you are not in the minority. If God is on your side, you are in the majority. And when David walked down to that valley floor, he knew that he was not alone, that he had all of heaven's armies there with him fighting this battle for him. And God will not leave you to face your giants alone. There's a God in heaven who loves you and he's called you and he's anointed you and he's purposed you and he's equipped you and he's going to send all of heaven's armies to fight this battle for you. He's for you. He's not against you. Come on, somebody needs to give him praise and let that word get in their heart today. He loves you today. He's going to fight for you today. You're more than a conqueror today. You are the head. You are not the tail. It's not over. The season that you are in is not the end. This is just the beginning. If you'll surrender your life and your heart and your fears to an almighty loving God, and his name is Jesus. Whew, I'm preaching today, brother. I don't know where that came from. That was just for somebody. I don't know. Oh, I don't even know where I am. I've left the notes a long time ago. I'm nine minutes over. Um, let me just say this, and I'll wrap it up. You guys go eat. When you're trying to defeat some giants in your life, here's what I can guarantee is going to happen. When, when you set out to have the audacity to believe that God has a purpose for me, like you really believe that, that you're not a mistake. Yeah, so what? You screwed up. So what, you've made some mistakes. I get it. Your life isn't maybe where you thought it should be at this moment. But in this moment, if you could grab hold of this fact that God is really for you, and he wants to help you, and he wants to set some things free in your life and break some chains that have been holding you back, as soon as you begin to say, you know what, I'm going to move in this direction, there's going to be people that are going to criticize you. There's going to be people that are going to come against you. And so my encouragement to you, if you're facing some giants, you're just going to have to ignore some of the critics. They're, you're just going to have to ignore them. I mean, I know uh, about critics, and I've had my share just like you've had your share. David shows up on the battlefield, and he says, I'll fight him. He goes to the king. Word spreads that this kid, this shepherd's going to go fight the giant that nobody else is willing to fight. And then, you know how, you know the only reason David is there? Because some of you think, well, here's my giant. i got a dysfunctional family. My family's jacked up. Okay, I get it, and I'm sorry. But so was David's. His family was so jacked up. His dad pretty much hated him. He thought like this much of him. He was the youngest of eight brothers. He was the runt of the pack. He was a skinny, scrawny kid. He wasn't even warrior material. That's why his dad didn't let him go to war like all his seven bigger brothers that like walked off the cover of GQ magazine, all chiseled chin and, you know, six-pack abs. And there's the scrawny kid with the guitar in the corner all in like goth. And he's over there, David, playing his little songs. And his dad didn't think much of him because he was like an artist. He was a creative. He wore skinny jeans. <laughs> Deep V-neck t-shirts. Scarves. And his dad thought very little of him. They had a horrible relationship. You read the story, it's there. And that kind of stuff flows down in a family. And all of his brothers hated him too. He shows up there, word travels, and his older brother, Eliab, when he finds out what his young brother is there to do, here's what he says. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. He was hot, red hot mad at his younger brother. Here's what he says. Why have you come down here? Why aren't you at home? And who, who'd you leave to take care of the, the few sheep in the wilderness? Like, you can't even take care of a whole flock. You just, daddy put just you in charge of it a little bit. You stay home with mama in the kitchen. Make me something to eat. You know, the only reason he's there, his dad thought so little of him, he didn't even send him to war. Then his dad got upset. His dad, his name was Jesse. He got up, he, he was concerned that his older brothers, because the standoff was taking so long, that they would grow hungry. So he sends basically David there with a backpack of cheese sandwiches for his brothers. That's the only reason he's there to begin with. And then he hears this giant cursing his God, and he sees all these so-called strong men who are scared to death and won't fight him. And he says, well, I'll fight him. 
the word travels. And he says, why do you come down here? He says, I know you're conceited. Your heart is wicked. Listen, he's judging his brother's heart. You know what's so sad? What's really sad is when you have a dream that, that people will come against you. I get all that. But you know what's really sad? People don't want to see you accomplish your dream, and they want to nitpick and cut you off at the knees, and they want to tear you down. But what's really, I get that from just people. But what's really sad is when your own family members do that to you. This is his brother. Your heart is wicked. You're only here for yourself. You're conceited. You're full of pride. You're in this for the show. Okay, buddy, we'll see how you do. What, and David's like, well, what have I done? Can I even speak to defend myself? Sometimes you don't need to defend yourself from the critics. You just need to ignore your critics. I decided a long time ago that I was going to live for the approval of God, not the approval of men. It's none of my business what you think of me. It's all of my business what God thinks of me. The reality is, if you want to just live for the approval of men, you'll be a miserable man because you can't please everybody. You're going to have to make certain decisions. You're going to have to make certain calls. Everybody's not going to be happy. Your character will be maligned. Your intentions will be misinterpreted. Your, your reputation will be tarnished for things that just aren't true. Here's my advice to ignore them. Just like David, he ignored them. You go on in 1 Samuel 30, it says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord. Sometimes you just have to forget about everybody else and get into your quiet place and strengthen yourself in the Lord. You gotta speak to your own soul. You say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, David said, and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sometimes you just gotta speak to your soul and say, come on soul, be encouraged. Come on, God is for me today. He is not against me. Come on, God is gonna fight this battle. He is with me. He has not abandoned me. Twelve years ago, when we started looking for property to build this building, we had for um, three or four, uh, six years, we met at West High School as a portable church. Six years, set this thing up, tear it down every week. Church grew to about three, four hundred people. We started looking for property, and I found a guy. He was a real estate agent, and started to work with him. He wasn't a believer. He was an Irishman um, in every sense of the word. And um, he used to take us, Beck and I, around in the car looking for property to buy. And I told him, Here, here's what I want. I want 50 acres. I want high visibility. And I want high accessibility. And he looked at me and says, well, you know what? That doesn't exist in the Poconos, at least not in the price range that you are in. So he started taking me around to all these, like, little back neighborhoods all over, you know, Monroe County. Little one-acre, two-acre, three-acre parcels. And I'm like, dude, this isn't what I want. I told you what I want. I want 50 acres. I want it to be high visibility. I don't want to be tucked back in some neighborhood. I want it to be high visibility, and I want it to be easy for people to get to, right off a of main drag. High visibility. And, and he, gives, he just kept taking me all these little places, and I finally said, look, man, look, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. You, if, why, why do you keep taking, he's, he says, fine, he says, he says to me, who do you think you are? That's what he said to me. And I listened. He said, you don't have the money. You don't have the people. You don't need that kind of big property. You can't afford it. He said, who do you think you are? And I said to him, I said, look, you've, you've asked me the wrong question. The wrong question is, who do you think you are? The right question is, who do you think God is? I said, I come to the Poconos in the name of the Lord God Almighty. He is mighty to save. He's going to give us 50 acres that we can develop for the glory of God. It's going to be high visibility. It's going to be high accessibility. And if you can't find me that piece of property, I'm going to go work with somebody else who can help find me that piece of property. Listen to me. This isn't about who you are. It's about who God is. Who do you think God is? God is mighty to save. Come on. He is great in power. He is awesome indeed. And when God gives you a dream, ignore those critics. And last of all, let me just say this. Expect God to help you. Not for you, but for him. Not for your glory, but for his. I love what David said. We read it earlier. He said this to the giant. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword... And it's not by spear that the Lord saves, 
for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Gang, who does the battle belong to? It belongs to the Lord, and he is mighty to save. This is not by might nor by power, but it is by my spirit that God will help you face down the giants that are in your path, and he will give you, come on, victory. Somebody give God praise today. He wants you to walk in victory today. He wants you to walk in confidence today. He wants you to walk in faith today. Jesus said, according to your faith, will it be done unto you? My question for you is this. What are you expecting God to do in your life in 2018? Expand your faith. Trust in God. Have an abiding confidence that you're not alone, that he is with you. And all of heaven's armies are by your side. Listen, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You don't have to be the best looking. You don't have to be the most talented. You don't have to be the most put together. But if you'll have faith, even the size of a mustard seed, God can do big and mighty things in your life. Put your trust in him today. Put your confidence in him. Turn to him today. And he will deliver you from all of your fears. For God is love. And perfect love drives out all fear. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing today. There's an undeniable presence of your spirit in this room. And in these closing moments, I pray, God, that you will take and solidify this word in each of our spirits. If there's those that are here today that are far from you, Father, they, they, they've not been... Lord, um, everything that you've called them to be. Lord, if they've made some mistakes, if they've sinned, Father, right now in this closing moment, may they turn to you, Father. May they repent and, and say, God, I'm sorry. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me. Deliver me from all of my fears. I want to live for you. I'm choosing this day. I'm drawing a line in the sand. I want to be on your side, not on the enemy's side. I want you fighting my battles for me. I want to walk in victory and fulfill your plan and destiny for my life. If you pray that prayer today, I believe God will deliver you from all of your fears. It's in your name I pray.